The First Look newsletter brings you news headlines from all over Asheville every weekday morning. You can scan it at a glance and see if there's something you've missed or just need to know more about. There are no ads disguised as stories, just the headlines in a quick, easy read. Get the First Look newsletter for free at podavl, that's P-O-D-A-V-L dot com slash newsletter. You'll find I'll tell a story Both true and allegorial The process is precious So it takes up all my time Three seats on Asheville City Council will be filled in November's general election. But to get there, we need to first get through a small stakes primary. I say small stakes because of the seven candidates on the ballot, only one will drop off after the March 5th primary. Still, that didn't keep locals from packing Citizen Vinyl last Tuesday for a casual mixer with the candidates, thrown by the Asheville Downtown Association. Six of the seven people running showed up, chatted up prospective voters, and sat down with me for quick conversations about their candidacies. In this episode, you'll hear from Bo Hess, Kevin Frazier, and sitting councilwoman Sage Turner. In Wednesday's episode, I'll speak with India Pearson, CJ Domingo, and sitting councilwoman Kim Roney. First up in my one-on-ones is Bo Hess, and I began by asking about his background. I was born in Lubbock, Texas. My dad was in the military. I've lived all over. I've lived in Texas, Ohio, Delaware, Lake and Heath, England, North Carolina, but home is Asheville. I've lived here for two decades. I consider myself a proud Asheville-in, a social worker, therapist, addiction specialist, law enforcement trainer, community advocate. I volunteer at ABCCM. I'm also their clinical supervisor and just really problem solver and just really proud and grateful to be in this race. That's a lot of labels that you wear. Is this your first candidacy for city council? For city council, yes, but not first candidacy. Tell me, what was your first candidacy? I ran for U.S. House a couple years ago as an underdog campaign. Politics is all about trust, especially in Western North Carolina and Asheville. People want you to show up. They want to meet you. They want to look you in the eye. They want to shake your hand. They want to get to know you. And as a social worker, as a therapist, a big piece of effective therapy is building rapport with people. And so I ran that campaign to prove that I could run a disciplined campaign that stuck to the issues, that was hardworking, and also to set me up for the city council race in 2024. That's a kind of a, a typically backward way into a city council candidate. Usually people are city council people or mayors, and then they run for Congress or Senate. Why are you running for city council after all this time? What have you witnessed in Asheville politics or governance that you're not happy with, that you think you can affect a different kind of direction or change? So as a social worker, I I can work collaboratively with anybody. You know, I've never asked any of my patients, are you a Republican, Democrat, Independent? What's your affiliation? But we work to find common ground and work towards solutions that provide an impact to their everyday life. And that's exactly what I will commit to doing uh, for the community of Asheville. But do you think that's not happening now? I I might be naive in this, but I would think that a lot of people, they run for school board or city council or different offices because they think a certain job isn't happening right now. There isn't like the direction that council or whatever the seat that you're running for. I'm just not happy with how things are going. Would that describe you? I think it's the right time, you know, with my expertise in mental health and in social work. I think it's an enhancement versus I'm not running against anyone in this race. I'm really running to fill the open seat. And Asheville has a unique opportunity right now to elect someone who is an expert at the issues that we need to address in the coming years. Mental health, safety, houselessness issue, addiction, and affordability. Tell me how your backgrounds in those areas will inform the conversation in a way that you either haven't seen happening now or not happening with the education of being on the ground in the way you have? Yeah, so I work at a large psychiatric hospital here in Asheville. I've worked there for over 10 years, and I have a small private practice on Hendersonville Road. I train law enforcement officers. I uh, contract with different addiction programs here, and working at the hospital 
especially, really gives me a kind of bird's eye view of the gaps in services and things that we need in Asheville. About 40% of all of my patients have a severe uh, mental illness or are dealing with suicide or homicidality or psychosis. But about 40% of those people are also uh, either at risk of being houseless or are actually houseless. And so um, not only do I see the gaps in where we can plug those gaps in for houselessness, but I see the gaps where we can really enhance our mental health and health care services in Asheville to make it the best so that every single resident, whether you live in a shelter or whether you live in Biltmore Park or Biltmore Forest, is thriving. Now, we have restricted funds in this city in a lot of ways. Uh, Sage talked to that a a little bit about our largest pool of unrestricted funds being property taxes. How do you see yourself wanting to shift funding priorities to address the issues you're just talking about? It does take political will to build the Asheville that we all deserve, right? And the money is already there. It's about how we can use it in a way that protects the taxpayer's dollar and makes it go a long way. One thing is we're not going to spend $5 million on five buses that don't work, number one, and we're not going to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on consultants to spend months and months delaying a vote, and then we don't have the money to actually implement what they ask for. We're going to use that money wisely. I come from a working class background. One thing about people who don't make a lot of money is we know how to budget, right? And we know how to make a little go a lot. And also, I want to build community. I want to build an Asheville that thrives. I want to enhance our parkways, greenways. I think every quarter we can have a show that highlights our wonderful musicians and artists and actors and visual artists. And we can have a festival, $7 wristband. That $7 wristband, that goes into our pot to address those things that we need to address that goes directly back into our community. But these things, I mean, they cost money. The city has its downtown after five. Yes. and So what other sorts of new... This is one idea. And I want to ask you, what are other ideas? Let's say there's no new funding. What do you believe is possible with existing funding that we're not doing right now? For well, one, I don't want to raise any taxes on anyone. So I, I do want to be clear about that. We can't raise taxes other than property taxes, right? right? The state and limits... we're not going to do can, that. What can happen? We have the money there. It's about addressing what the needs of the community are in that moment and hearing input, addressing what we actually need, and then using our willpower and power to make those things happen. One of those things that we can do is increase competitive bidding. When I look at some of these bidding, like for the Ramada Inn, there wasn't really a competitive process that happened. So we need to open up that process, make it more transparent, and maybe even do blind bidding so they don't know it's the city that's doing it so that we don't get charged the highest dollar because they know it's a government doing it. There how, are, how, how, how can we hide that the city's doing it? That's part of the, transparency, right? There, oh, no, not not with the voters, but with, with the actual buyers. Right. Again, that's just one idea. You'd have to run that by the city attorney. But there is a way to make it where we're not being charged. Look at the past few deals we've gotten. We've gotten nothing for our money. And we've got to make it more transparent. We have to make it more open and more equitable. And also, we need to be giving the people who are accountable to our community, who have businesses in our community, that business, instead of hiring outside agencies and businesses like from California to do the work in Asheville and in our community. Yeah. Is there anything we haven't addressed or talked about you want to leave with? Other than I am committed to working collaboratively with whoever wins as part of the candidates, I'm proud to say I have a good working relationship with all of the candidates, an excellent working relationship with the current council members. I can work with anyone and work towards common goals and make sure that Asheville has the Asheville that we all deserve. Next up is my conversation with Kevin Frazier. Probably nobody knows more about the history of this city than you do. You lead walking tours of it. Why, after all this time, are you finally seeking a city council seat? To be honest, Matt, I was in a conversation a few months ago. Some things that I was frustrated that the city wasn't moving forward about as quick as I would like. And finally, I'm like, okay, you know what? You've spent 25 years teaching the history of the city of Asheville and all these people that stepped up, well, step up yourself. Don't be upset and and frustrated and not be willing to 
do the work. So well, I'm let, wanting let, to do the work. Yeah, let's unravel that frustration. What specifically were you frustrated by? You've had such a long span in Asheville. I imagine you've seen so many peaks and valleys of the way things are done. What is happening right now or not happening right now that you think is heightened your frustration? It's a variety, variety of things. On the whole, I think our city, because of our great residents, we're moving in a forward direction. But I think we're still feeling tied down to the pandemic and being in such a reactionary mode for long, so long. I want to see us move to more proactive. I think we need to be out listening to all of our neighbors, crafting what is a shared vision, and then work on a plan to meet that vision. One of the things I've, that's been itching me lately, it seems minor, but it has ripple effects, is the money we're having to spend to repair the parking decks. Do we need to repair the parking decks? Absolutely. But what frustrates me is that we didn't have a business plan for a revenue-generating function of city government that we ought to have been saving up in reserves like you would in any other kind of property for when the repairs are needed to be able to do that. So those are the kind of things I'd like to see us address. That's minor, but that takes money away from something else. That's two questions I want to ask there. So you're talking about a business plan. Are you saying around the parking decks, a business plan? Yeah, a business plan around the parking decks. Well, it's a revenue source. Certainly. And that can be developed at any time, right? So there are lots of ways people are making money now. Businesses are making money. Individuals are making money that weren't even on the thought pattern 10 years ago. How to get creative has even shifted now. Let's talk about a shifting of priorities. You just brought that up. What do you want to see shift? What do you think is overemphasized that you would scale back on or want to see de-emphasized to make room in the budget for some of the things you're talking about? That's a great question. I have to say I'm all flip it a bit in that I do think about one of the things that are absolute priorities for me. That's public safety, our role with affordable housing and homelessness. But the two undergirds to that are equity and environmentalism. I'm concerned at how our environmental priorities for the city keep moving further and further down the priority list. We've actually got some great environmental policy, but we're not following through with it. We're not checking ourselves to see where we're meeting our goals along the way. So those are the areas that I want to make sure we're keeping an eye on. And at this point in the campaign, I am starting to go deeper into the budget to understand what's going on. I'm going to attend the council's planning sessions here in the next couple of days to understand where all that is. Asheville has more resources now than it's ever had, but we seem pretty strapped at times. When you say more resources, you mean just raw dollars, raw dollars in the budget? Raw but everything dollars. costs more now. So it's Absolutely. Not, so it's not as if we have more money to play with because everything is costing more. You just touched on the environment that you feel that we're not resourcing. We're not prioritizing. We're not, we're not prioritizing. We're not investing in the environment, which is funny to me because we have a lot of people on the city council who will speak very prominently and actively about wanting to be pro environment and how it's a big priority. You look at our city buses, the electric buses. So there are things that have been done. How do you think we haven't been prioritizing the environment in a way that we should? Part of that is where I am with some of the other items as well. It's about needing the data to see what our results are to then make the next decisions. We're not really tracking through some of our city departments and units. Are we meeting goals that got set a few years back? Where are we at with that? So I think that's important that we do that as a city and that council evaluates that and then say, and be able to be in dialogue with the department to say, we're having trouble making this happen. We need resources or we need a policy change. Then let's work together to figure out how we do that. You mentioned the word equity. How can or how would you as a city council member enact that commitment to equity in ways that aren't necessarily tabulated in a vote count? I think one an important way that we can address equity is in multimodal transportation. Every Ashevillian ought to be able to get to work, school, the grocery store, in whatever way they choose. We have neighborhoods that have no sidewalks, so people can't really walk. We have neighborhoods it's tough to have a bike lane or take a bike off. We have neighborhoods that don't have access to city transit. We don't have access outside of the city to transit to bring folks in who are doing the hard work in the city. And by addressing all of that, 
then we're making sure that we're being equitable across all of our neighborhoods and all of our neighbors have the same level of access so they can get to work, get to school, do whatever they need to in their lives and not be reliant on one particular mode or the other. When we talk about history, it's not just in the here and now. You have a lens on the way things have been done and the way the city has developed over the decades, centuries. How do you think your knowledge as a historian will shape how you work as a city council member? That is such a great question for a history nerd. Thank you for that, Matt. For me, it's looking at the past as... um, a lesson for the future. It's not about repeating or not repeating the past. A great example is there's a, an important part of Asheville's history that was tied to over-municipal spending in the 1920s, that when the stock market crashes and the, and the Great Depression's fully ushered in, Asheville had the largest per capita debt of any city in the United States, and it was crippling for more than a half century. In the end, we're the only city that repaid it all. However, we as a city today don't have a very mature bond program. Other cities have a set of rotating bonds. It's how they fund big projects. And I think we've become scared because of the lore of that story, but we got to do a little bit more digging to realize that was a different situation 100 years ago than it is today, and that bonds aren't something we ought to be scared about, and we can do that and not be putting ourselves in financial crisis. When you say bonds, so we're talking about things we would put referendums in front of voters to fund certain things. Yes, but there are also ways in North Carolina that cities can do those without having to have a vote every time because the votes are also expensive. But if the city lays that out and the citizens understand what it's about, they can say, yeah, thumbs up and let's do this over several years. That's how you do the sort of daily projects, not necessarily how you would approach, say, replacing Thomas Wolfe. That's a much bigger bond issue, but that would also be part of the equation because you'd still have that debt. This is not novel to us. This is cities all over the country do this, and some of them do it really well. Speaking of which, what do you see as, look at this city, we should be more like that? I always like to look at... Portland, Maine. I think there's some good lessons there. That's a fantastic city, by the way. (laughs) It's a great city. It's about our size. There are some commonalities between us and Chattanooga, Tennessee. Also a really interesting city to be in and and a great example of one that had evolved itself. In North Carolina, I like to pay attention to Durham and Wilmington. There's similar sizes. Durham's a little bit different, but I like Durham's edge and that they look forward, and I feel like we're a forward-looking city. And then Wilmington, they work also with that mix of making sure they take care of their residents and welcome visitors as well, and how to do that in a way that is respectful for everybody and doesn't have one dominating. We'll close with my conversation with Sage Turner, who is in the final year of her first term as a city councilwoman. What do you feel you didn't get a chance to accomplish that you went into your initial candidacy with? What didn't happen that you were hoping to, and what do you want to see happen now? So it's not that anything isn't that's not been doing or happening. It's that we're just not done. So I set out in 2020... And this was, when we started campaigning, it was before the pandemic, right? So I set out campaigning on affordable housing, something I'd been leading the community on for about seven years at the time, and on environmental process and progress and on downtown sustainability and overall smart growth for the city because I knew the pressures that the city was facing for growth, both from the outside regions and internally, were just too much. And it was spilling over into neighborhoods, and we didn't have any practical plans of how to deal with that growth. So smart growth principles were in play. Now, I would say as we've jumped forward four years, we got stalled in some of this work, mostly because of the pandemic. We spent about a year and a half doling out about $26 million in federal rescue money. I mentioned earlier I'm on a four-county board that I chair for housing, and we also received a large amount of money that we spent just doling out over another year and a half. So we spent a lot of time working on those processes early on, also dealing with some chaos around staff shortages. No one came back, no industry came back from the pandemic really well. So 
I don't think that there's necessarily things we haven't been able to get done. It's just taken longer. So my commitment in running again is to make sure those things keep happening. Like we've made great strides in affordable housing. We've built over a thousand units in my first term, but there's like three or four thousand more needed right behind them. And also the type of housing we bring in is a big issue. You talked about the pandemic and the pandemic has punctuated your entire time on the council. And I imagine it has changed the priorities for how city council looks at its agenda. How has the pandemic, even though we are largely, quote, out of the pandemic, how do you think it has affected the council's outlook about budget and priorities? More after this. Hey everyone, Matt Pikin here from The Overlook, and I'll get back to my conversation in just a moment. But I'm asking you, the listener, yes, you, listening this very moment, is The Overlook making a difference in your connection to Asheville? Do you know more about what makes this city tick and where we're struggling? If you had to give up one cup of coffee every month to do your part to keep this show going, would you step up? If you answered yes to any of that, and I really hope you did, Please join dozens of other listeners by supporting The Overlook with Matt Pikin through my Patreon campaign by giving just $5 a month. Give it higher levels and you'll earn free tickets to my live podcasting events. Your support means the world to me and helps keep this show free for anyone to hear. Go to patreon.com slash The Overlook Podcast. I'd say pretty dramatically, if you were to look at the initiatives that came through from us investing the $26 million in the community, you could step back and say that those are the things we should have been doing all along. We're responding to a crisis that was temporary, but we're responding in ways that we should have built the city in the first place, which I think has been really enlightening. This recent issue of Peak Academy, right? We've got a new charter school specializing in young black youth and their education and the achievement gap because we have the worst in the state. And they're seeking $500,000, which is literally what we have left in our rescue funds. And it's an opportunity to infuse this school with what they need to get the right head start, to get the strong beginning that they need to become a long-lasting school in the community. And it seems to me that if we didn't have that rescue money, we wouldn't be able to do it. But all along, these are the kind of initiatives we needed to be investing in. Did pandemic money from the federal government, did that spoil cities? In terms of, we have this extra funding to do certain things, and now that that money's going away, is it harder now to recalibrate your budgeting priorities? Not really. I mean, it did set some unprecedented moves. We had never invested in a school before, for example. But the federal government, when they deployed these funds, were very strict in how it can be used. And we're not supposed to use it for operational monies that will have a continual need. So it's most of the infusions in capital and infrastructure that we were able to do. One of the things I was curious about, you've been on for one term now, obviously the pandemic influenced a lot of what you faced. What issues have you come around on or pivoted on in terms of your views when you first got on council and what was a priority for you? And what has shifted for you because of your experience on council? What is different about the way you're approaching your job and your priorities that you would not have anticipated back in 2020? This is a really good question because I couldn't have anticipated it. And really, I would say the level of input from the community and the teamwork that has to happen at that city council of seven people to actually get anything done. So my priorities haven't changed. They've maybe grown. I've certainly learned things from the pandemic, but from my first term, I would say one of the biggest lessons I've had is that it literally requires a team. Four people on council have to support something or it doesn't move forward. So relationships with people, whether you agree with them or not, relationships out in the community, whether you agree with them or not, are absolutely needed to do this kind of work. Can you talk about that a little more? Because you, as you said, you're just one council person. Building relationships is key. And I know there are different styles for everybody on that council. Was there any pivotal moment for you or a vote that came up that you look back on, oh, I wish I handled this differently? Not that I wish that I handled differently, but I'll share with you one that was recent and somewhat eye-opening and pivotal. And it was related to downtown, actually, so it's a good one for tonight. It was the College and Patton Street bike lanes and multimodal streets, right? 
And this, this plan had come together over time. The community had long-standing plans that said this is what we want to do with our streets. But when it came down to council, we were split. We had three white councilwomen in support and three black councilwomen in not, that did not support. And there I was in the middle going, this is odd. I thought we believed in complete streets. I thought they brought equity to all community members. But clearly, we don't agree at the dais. And I treat my role on city council both as a representative of the community, but I also have great respect for my other councilwomen because I respect the fact that they were voted in too and they represent a large community sect. So I took that to heart. We stalled the, view, the vote. I went back and forth. I was actually pretty torn about it because I see the great value of complete streets in downtown, but it, I had to step back and think, why do my colleagues not support this and what does that really mean? How did they articulate that to you? What came out in those conversations that were aha moments or just points of revelation that you would not have known on your own as a white woman? I don't know that it's what I wouldn't have known, but I think the points they brought up were that Similar to what the business community was saying about the bike lanes, we have so many needs, why are you focused on bike lanes instead of all of these other needs? And I think that was just a, a, a moment in time to step back and say, we really do have to have priorities here, and why is this it? That argument of why focus on A when we have B, why is it an either or? There are so many issues that come up for city council without pinpointing this specific vote or issue. Do you think that's often a scapegoat or a red herring for just, I don't want to deal with this issue or I don't want to have to face this issue? I don't know if it's that, but I will say it happens time and time again. And I don't understand why we point one community need against the other. It's happening right now in the argument and discussion in the media around supporting Peak Academy and also a downtown standalone restroom. And the community is approaching it as if we can't do both, as if one is somehow more important than the other. But the reality is we can do hard things. We can do many things. If you get back on council, if you're voted back on, how do you expect to do things or what expectations do you have of yourself for this next term that you could not have scripted going into your first term? More about how you ha approach the job, how you approach your constituents. I'm sure you've had feedback from them over your four years that, oh, I didn't know people felt this way or, oh, sure. I didn't know city council bears the brunt of this expectation when we have no power to affect this issue or I'm just wondering if now being a seasoned city council person does that make you a better city council person? Oh. I think it does in the sense that you spend a long time learning how things operate, learning how the city works and learning where those needed relationships are and that is invaluable experience. So having an incumbent I think has inherent value already. Now what I would learn from it and what I've taken back from the community, say a great example is my affordable housing advocacy. I really do lead the community in affordable housing. But every time we have a study that says we need it, every time we go to that saying we have to have more housing to bring the price down, we have to have more housing in every part of the city, a project will come in and it will be fought against by every neighborhood. No one wants it near them, et cetera. You've seen the story, All right? All the time. All the time. And I think what I've learned from that is that there is some kind of approachable middle ground. I've worked with developers, I've worked with communities, I've worked with neighborhood coalitions to really bring folks together and see what can come of these projects that both gets us the needed housing, but doesn't necessarily upset the neighborhood or overwhelm it, that's more manageable. This is a lot of the reason why the missing st middle study came to be. It's something I push very hard for because we shouldn't have to live in a community of mega apartment complexes or small $700,000 houses. Everything in the middle is literally missing. That wraps up part one from last Tuesday's City Council Candidate Mixer at Citizen Vinyl, put on by the Asheville Downtown Association. On Wednesday, we'll hear from India Pearson, C.J. Domingo, and Kim Roney. The seventh candidate on the ballot, Todd Levin, couldn't be at this event. If you value the Overlook's place in Asheville's media landscape, please consider joining dozens of others who are supporting the show through my Patreon crowdfunding page. Become a member for as little as $5 a month. Visit patreon.com slash theoverlookpodcast.
Our First Look newsletter gives you just a handful of daily headlines from around the local media landscape to get you on your morning. We also have a weekly newsletter devoted to all things The Overlook that hits you every Friday. Both are free and available at podavl.com slash newsletter. The theme song for The Overlook, Maker's Song, comes to us courtesy of the Asheville duo The Resonant Rogues. The Overlook is a production of Podcast Asheville. New episodes come out every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday wherever you get your podcasts. You can find us on any social media channel at AVL Overlook. And I'll see you on the next episode of The Overlook with Matt Pikin.